common misperception that I come across every once in a while is people believing that the Labour Party of the UK is somehow a socialist party. However... Hey, I'm, uh, I'm not a lumberjack or a fur trader, and I don't live in an igloo or eat blubber or own a dog sled, and I don't know Jimmy, Sally, or Susie from Canada, although I'm certain they're really, really nice. Uh, I have a Prime Minister, not a President. I speak English and French, not American, and I pronounce it about, not a boot. I can proudly sew my country's flag on my backpack. I believe in peacekeeping, not policing, diversity, not assimilation, and that the beaver is a truly proud and noble animal. A toot is a hat, a Chesterfield is a coach, and it is pronounced Z, not Z, Z. Canada is the second largest land mass, the first nation of hockey, and the best part of my name is Joe, and I am Canadian! Thank you. Teaching Marxism by using popular culture, particularly video games, using... Socialism. Spokesman for the Socialist Labour Party that year made public these planks in the party platform. The Labour Party is a socialist party and is proud of it. Its ultimate purpose at home is the establishment of the socialist commonwealth of Great Britain. We pledge ourselves to these ends. Public or government ownership of the essential industries. Government ownership of the railroads and other transport. Government ownership of the Bank of England. Government ownership of the land. Central planning of production. Government control of prices and, where necessary, wages. Heavy progressive income tax. Extremely heavy inheritance tax. Full employment and government control of medical services. These, then. car, bus, truck and airplane manufacturing, the coal industry, the oil industry, the gas industry, the steel industry, iron, water, electricity were all nationalized, telecommunications were nationalized, much of the computer industry, radio and television were nationalized, the government even took over some pubs and the travel agent Thomas Cook. Britain, once the world's leading capitalist industrial nation, became one of the most state-owned of any country outside the communist world. You might wake up in the morning and brush your teeth with state water, get into your state-produced car, avoiding state-produced lorries and buses. You might pick up your state telephone, phone the state travel agent, book a holiday taking off from a state airport in a state-produced aircraft, and so it went on. You could go through the entire day without ever contacting the free enterprise side of the economy. Mrs Thatcher, Mrs. Thatcher was finally elected to Parliament in 1959. Talk of the front bench, how do you feel about that? Well, I think we'll just try to be a very good backbencher first. It was a grim time for Britain. According to the post-war consensus, nationalisation would bring prosperity. But instead, Britain suffered a period of rapid decline. The problem with state industries was basically that being a monopoly, uh, funded 
from the public purse, they didn't have to try. <laughs> Private enterprise keeps itself efficient and cost effective because otherwise people will turn to their competition and they'll go broke. When you work in an environment like that and you see it day in, day out, you can see what's going on. The management what was looking after the works just didn't, didn't care about the costs. They just let it go because they knew that if they lost money, the, the government would pay for it. By the 1970s, state-owned Britain was on its knees, outdated and overmanned. The nationalised industries were making huge losses. They were not producing wealth, they were consuming it. Britain, once the workshop of the world, was now the sick man of Europe. British Steel, British Telecom, British Gas, it doesn't matter. If it had the word British in front of it, it was basically nationalised and was completely on its backside. And it represented where the country was as well. The country was on its backside. The popular British playwright Bernard Shaw supported Hitler in the mass media. The left supported Hitler not because he deceived them. They knew Hitler would kill. He said he would. In fact, it was why they supported him. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. Just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social vote, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive because your life does not benefit us and it can't be of very much use to yourself. Bernard Shaw believed in, the, in uh, masculine by category, not usually by racial category, but by category, you know, the idle, the unfit. Killing off the parasites within society was what Marxian socialism was about. It demanded in a, in a London newspaper that the scientists should devise a humane gas. I appeal to the chemists to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly. Deadly by all means, but humane, not cruel. After 10 years, such gas will be discovered. It will be called Cyclone B. The man who oversaw its practical application, Adolf Eichmann, will later testify that thanks to Cyclone B, people in Auschwitz died without pain. Cyclone B was a humane gas. Yes, Eichmann will use the very same words. It must be said, though, that Bernard Shaw, as well as the left in general, fundamentally opposed Nazism. Because Hitler had distorted Marxism beyond recognition. Gassing people based on their nationality was absolutely inexcusable. The selection should be based on class. Hitler got it all wrong. Absolutely different people needed to be killed. It's no good in this country putting questions of national importance to me. I've been here before, I told you what to do and you haven't done it. And you're up to your neck in trouble in consequence. I told you in New York, I put it to you very carefully and exactly. I told you that what you had to do in this country was to abolish your constitution, which was preventing you from doing anything. And now you see what's happened since. Every attempt you've made to do anything, the Supreme Court immediately stops it and says it's against the Constitution. Well, I tell you again, get rid of your Constitution. But I suppose you won't do it. You have a good president and you have a bad Constitution. And the bad Constitution gets the better of the good president all the time. The end of it will be that you might as well have an English Prime Minister. I don't know how it is. But people who only know me from reading my books or sometimes even from seeing my plays get a most unpleasant impression of me. And uh, 
the people who really uh, meet me, as you have been kind enough to meet me, uh, to meet me now, well, they see that I am a most harmless person. I'm quite a kindly person, you know. But uh, uh, still, I, uh, it's not necessary for me always to look as genial as I'm trying to look now. Of course, I can put on the other thing, I, uh, for instance. Now, that is, uh, that is what I call my Mussolini study. They, uh, by the way, uh, I think in justice to Signor Mussolini, I ought to tell you that he has a way, very wonderful head. He has a wonderful brow which comes down to here. But the difficulty is that he can't take it off. Now, if you watch me, I can put on that imposing look that terrifies the Mussolini look. But, now just watch. I can take it off. Now, Signor Mussolini cannot take it off. He is condemned, although he is a most amiable man, he is condemned to go through life with that terrible and imposing expression which really does a great deal of injustice to his kindly nature. But I, I can put it on and I can take it off and do all sorts of things. However, I see really no reason for anyone to act. Nobel Prize winner, Fabian socialist and prominent Soviet supporter, George Bernard Shaw. I don't want to punish anybody, but there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps anything more, then uh, clearly, uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive because your life does not benefit us and it can't be of very much use to yourself. And this was actually somewhat subtle for Shaw. He'd also foreshadow some of the worst atrocities in our planet's history. He wrote, I appeal to the chemists to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly. In short, a gentlemanly gas, deadly by all means, but humane, not cruel.